Okay, you're not alive, Stephen. Go ahead. All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, this is my first virtual PGCon. I imagine it probably is everyone else's too. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, looking at flow queries and uh, and doing uh, taking some actions to uh, to fix them as well. This is a relatively junior beginner kind of talking to Postgres, so I hope you're excited. Uh, I know I am. Um, I have a bit of history with Postgres. I've been working with Postgres for uh, I don't know 15, 20 years, something like that now, quite a long time. Um, I'm also the the chief technology officer at uh, Crunchy Data. I'm uh, Postgres committer, um, also a major contributor. I worked on uh, GSS API level encryption uh, in version 12. I worked on role-level security in 9.5, uh, column-level privileges uh, back in 8.4, and uh, I actually uh, implemented the, uh, the role system uh, way back in uh, 8.1. Um, I also worked on default, uh, default roles uh, that you may see in, in more recent versions of Postgres. I've made some other contributions to uh, PL, PGSQL, as well as PostGIS. So uh, just a couple of quick notes. Uh, you know, I recommend people follow Planet and uh, join PostgreSQL.eu and, and PostgreSQL.us, uh, depending on, you know, what your preferences are and interests. Uh, those are community-recognized uh, nonprofits. Uh, and Planet's obviously a, a blog aggregator. So let's talk about different ways that you can enable um, Postgres and uh, enable logging in Postgres in particular to work with and to help you find your slow queries. Um, you know, there's really three different major ways that I kind of like to work with Postgres to, to find slow queries. Um, and that's starting off with working on postgresql.conf and uh, enabling uh, a lot of logging in there and then doing log analysis using a tool called PG Badger. Uh, which is a very, very useful tool. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. We may have time to even uh, jump over and do a little bit of a demo. We'll see how well that works. Uh, it's always fun doing things virtually. It's even more fun than doing them uh, live, I think, in, in, or, you know, in person, I should say. Uh, and then one of the other ones that we'll talk about is, is PG Stat Statements, which is a really, really important tool. Uh, it comes with Postgres. Um, you just have to uh, run what's called Create Extension. Uh, to install PG stat statements as an extension on, on just about every modern distro uh, and then enable it through shared preload libraries. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go. Um, hopefully, we'll have some time also for, uh, for questions uh, a little bit later on. All right, when it comes to logging, uh, there's a number of different uh, PostgreSQL.com configuration variables uh, that are really useful for logging information about what is Postgres currently doing. Right, and not all of these are necessarily just about queries. Some of them are about other activities that the database is doing uh, that could then be impacting your ongoing queries. And that's some of the, what we're gonna look at here today because it's important to realize that, hey, just because my query is slow doesn't mean that the query itself has got problems. It may actually be because uh, auto vacuum is running. It could be because there's a checkpoint happening or it could be due to other causes, right? Maybe there's a lock being held. And we're gonna talk about these different uh, parameters. We're gonna go through each one of them and, and describe what it does, recommended settings, and how you can then, once you've got all of these settings enabled, uh, use a tool like PG Badger to then uh, pull all of that uh, information out and look at it uh, in some pretty nice HTML reports. So let's talk about it. The first one we're going to talk about is log min duration statement. So this is a little bit interesting. Postgres has some different ways of logging statements, right? The, the first one that you might look at is log statement. I don't recommend using it because if you do uh, use log statement um, or log duration, uh, you actually end up in a situation where PG Badger isn't actually able to um, combine up very easily uh, those, those different statements because with log statement and log duration, the actual statement and the log information ends up on two different rows, right? So that's actually why we invented this log min duration statement option. That actually puts the duration and the actual statement on the same line in the log file. And, and that's what you can see here. I'm not sure, hopefully my mouse pointer is being, is coming through, usually it is. But here you can see, we have the duration and the statement all on the same line, which is what you want, right? 
Uh, note that the number here is in milliseconds. Um, and, you know, I have uh, it set here as an example to zero. That may or may not be something that you can manage in your environment. It really depends on uh, how many queries you have logging. Uh, something to realize here is that that logging process of Postgres, um, it, it takes time and uh, each individual process ends up having to do that logging, right? And it does it while, um, you know, as part of the query itself. So because of that, when you have logging and duration statement set to a very, very low value where you're logging, you know, if you have it set to zero, for example, which will log every single statement, what you're going to see is that on a high rate, high throughput system that could actually impact your query performance and your, your transaction performance overall. So if you're in a high rate system and you want to get this information, you know, start with a higher number, start with maybe a couple of seconds, you know, set it to 2000 or so, because um, it's set in, in milliseconds. Um, and then you can maybe lower that, right? You could lower that down to 100 milliseconds once you've kind of hit all of those queries that you know are taking multiple seconds, you've tried to address them as best you can, and hopefully they're not happening frequently enough uh, to really be causing a problem. Once you've done that, right, then you can lower log min duration statement, but do so cautiously on a high rate system, um, because again, every statement log means time spent away from running queries um, for, your, for your Postgres instance. Uh, and, and they do all end up you know, potentially impacting the overall performance of the system if you set it really low. On the other hand, if you have the capability and you have the throughput to set it to zero and it doesn't impact your, um, you know, your performance too badly, uh, it ends up being a really great tool to go figure out exactly what happened. And it ultimately ends up giving you more information than you would be getting from a PG stat statement that we'll talk about later, because with log and duration statement, you know when every single query took place, right? That's one of the downsides of uh, PG stat statements is that you don't actually know when each individual query was run. Uh, at the same time, PG stat statements has uh, a lower impact on your overall performance uh, than log min duration statement zero. So we'll talk through that a little bit later, but I just wanted to kind of highlight this is this is really a, a critical piece to logging your slow queries in order to be able to find them. You first must know what they are. Uh, and that's where a log min duration statement can be really, really handy. All right, when it comes to, um, so I, I do have a question here uh, that came across. What is the best way to get an estimate of how much memory a particular, um, I, I think that's query on a database, on a PG database could take? Uh, there is no one pat answer um, to that question, unfortunately. Uh, because the amount of memory taken for a given query depends a great deal on the specifics of the query, right? So unfortunately, there isn't a, a clear or obvious answer to that question. In fact, the amount of memory can change over time, right? And it changes with the query plan. We're going to talk about query plans a, a, a little bit later on, um, but there isn't an answer to that, uh, to that question uh, kind of in an obvious or intuitive way. Um, you know, a, a kind of high level way of looking at it is if you're looking for some kind of maximum is you can say, okay, well, you know, we have work mem set to a certain value and we'll talk about work mem a little bit later as well. But once you have work mem set to that value, you know, multiply it by uh, some estimate of the number of nodes you have and that's an estimate, right? Um, nodes in the query plan tree is something else we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but you can, you can go with that as a high watermark if you need. Um, all right, let's talk about logline prefix. That's the next thing we're gonna talk about here. Um, in order to actually track these slow queries, you need to have certain information on the logline. And logline prefix is the option in Postgres that tells Postgres what to include on each and every logline. Uh, this particular logline prefix is one that I basically pulled from PG Badger as a recommendation. Um, and it, it, it seems like a good one to me as well. I'm not gonna go through every single thing in here. I wanna highlight a couple of things though. Uh, the first is the timestamp, which is obviously really important um, when you're logging these queries. Uh, second would be process ID, right? That's also a really important one. The user and database, of course, are important. Application name. This is one of those options that I don't think people appreciate enough, right? 
it can be really helpful if you set the application name in your um, applications when you connect, and you can do that just using um, a, a app name entry in your uh, connection uh, uh, string when you connect to Postgres, and then you know every single app that's actually running these queries, and you can correlate that back, right? Now you know not just the query, but you know what app it came from. So that's a really, really helpful and really useful setting. Um, if, you have, uh, if you have the option to set that, I, I strongly recommend doing so, and make sure that you include that here in your logline prefix so that you know which app it is that's connecting. Um, I think there's also, uh, in more modern versions of Postgres, you can also get that from log connections. We'll talk about log connections in a bit um, if you don't want to have that logged on every line. Uh, obviously, the remote host is useful. Uh, the, the percent queue is a little bit of an odd one. I just want to mention it because uh, that's the point in the logline prefix where we stop actually um, including any more information for non-session processes, which is useful because otherwise you end up with a bunch of empty variables and it looks funny. Uh, so here's an example of what that looks like down here. Pretty straightforward, not, not, too, not too special. All right, next is checkpoints. Now I mentioned this earlier about, you know, the database does other stuff while you're dealing with running your database system. And you wanna be able to say, okay, was something else happening when I was running my query that might've caused it to be slow? Checkpoints are one of those things. Um, and enabling of log checkpoints can help you determine whether or not there's some correlation there between, okay, was the problem that I was checkpointing or was the problem that the query is slow by itself? So I recommend setting that, lots of information down here, and you can also get that uh, into your PT Badger report, which is nice. Um, connection and disconnection are obviously very useful. Uh, I, they're pretty straightforward. These are some examples of logging connections and logging disconnections down here, very straightforward. Uh, logging lock weights. This is another one that's really, really handy and is really good for correlation, right, between when the query was running and what was going on. So what will happen is that if you enable this option, then after, um, then, then when Postgres has been waiting on a lock for a second, right, it'll run what's called the deadlock detector. The purpose of the deadlock detector is to figure out, okay, were there any deadlocks, right? Is there some kind of problem where I can't move forward? Right. In such a case that there's a deadlock, uh, the process that detected the deadlock will actually abort the transaction and, and roll back the transaction to allow the other processes to continue. Um, but the other nice thing is that when that deadlock detector runs with this option, it'll log all of the locks that it's currently waiting on. Right. This is really, really valuable information because you want to know, are any of my queries waiting on a lock, like is the reason that that query took five seconds, 10 seconds, whatever, uh, because the query was actually doing something or was it just because it was locked, you know, or blocked rather, waiting on some other process to finish whatever it's doing. And here you can see, as an example, this process was waiting on a share lock due to this transaction, right? And there was this process that was actually holding that lock and in fact, there's a wait queue as well that Postgres will tell you about anything else, any other processes that are in the queue waiting for the lock, right? This is really, really valuable information. Um, and it's not information that you get, again, through other mechanisms, uh, you know, such as PD set statements doesn't actually tell you about, well, we were waiting on a lock for, for 30 seconds. And that's why this, the max time on this query uh, was so high. So, uh, very, very valuable information. Obviously, in an ideal world, you're not waiting on locks, um, and Postgres is very good about that in most cases, but there, there are cases where you might be, and this is where log lock weights becomes very, very helpful and very valuable. Logging temp files. One of the other things that can happen with Postgres is once you reach a certain point in a query, right, um, it may need to start spilling out to, uh, to disk to complete that query, such as um, you have a very large sort operation that's happening. This is a, a pretty common thing where uh, you have WorkMem, say, configured for four megabytes, and your database is, you're trying to do a query with a sort inside of it that requires 16 megabytes, right? Well, what is going to end up happening there is Postgres is going to actually go out to an external disk sort, right? And it's going to start using temp files um, to do that sort operation. Now that is more expensive than doing it all in memory uh, in terms of overall time, uh, 
but it's better for memory utilization. So if you're concerned with memory utilization, then that, this is fine, but it does mean that your queries are going to be a little bit slower, right? So uh, this is, ends up being a, a really, really helpful tool, right? Just logging of temp files. And I like to set it to zero because I want to see all temp files that are created uh, in my database system so that I can look and go, okay, if I raise work mem, could this actually help with this query, right? And honestly, if you see temp files being created, upping work mem is like a really easy, quick solution potentially to that. Um, now you really wanna go look at the actual explain plans and whatnot uh, to get a better feel for what's going on if you have the time. But the short answer is if you increase work mem and suddenly you're not using temp files, chances are your query is also going faster. And that's great, that's what we like to see. So uh, obviously be cognizant of the fact that work mem um, ends up meaning using more memory and that means all of your individual backend processes could use more memory and you wanna watch out and make sure that you don't end up in a situation where you're using more memory than you have. Log auto vacuum in duration. So this is another one of those really useful logging parameters for looking at other activity on the database, right? Auto vacuum runs um, every minute to check if there's any work to be done. Um, and if it decides that it wants to go vacuum a table, it's gonna kick off a vacuum job to go do so. Uh, logging of that is enabled by log auto vacuum in duration. Um, again, I set this to zero so that I can see everything that's going on on my database system in my logs. And honestly, you know, a, a log message once a minute or, or three or four times a minute is, is not going to be an issue for pretty much any logging uh, environment. So. This ends up being really, really valuable information because you can see buffers used, read rate, system utilization for this auto vacuum. Now, one thing I'm going to mention here is that, you know, auto vacuum is, is usually, especially with the default values, not going to be impactful on your ongoing queries. Okay. Um, and, and I caution you against trying to do um, and they disable or otherwise uh, cause auto vacuum not to run because it's a very, very key and important part of Postgres and you need it running, okay? I, I, you really do. I don't recommend turning it off, but definitely look at what it's doing. Um, and hopefully in most cases, you're not gonna have any problems with, uh, with auto vacuum. But here you can see, was auto vacuum causing some kind of impact on my queries? Uh, and you can see that using log auto vacuum min duration. All right, so when you want to do log analysis with PG Badger, it's, it's really pretty straightforward. Um, you can, on a Debian-based system, if you're using our uh, PGDG uh, repository, um, it's pretty straightforward, right? App get install PG Badger, and then you can run PG Badger against your log file. Um, and then you get some really fancy, really useful, really nice uh, reports out of it. Um, and that's really something I think you should be uh, considering running as part of your uh, overall uh, in installation, right? Um, because it ends up being really, really handy, right? And it gives you some some fantastic reports. In fact, uh, I, I may be able to come back here and, and give you some examples of that um, once we're uh, through this a little bit. But I, what I'd like to do is first probably go look at PG stat statements, and then we'll come back to PG Badger and give you a little bit of a cute demo of PG Badger. All right. So let's go back to, okay. So moving on to PG stat statements. So installing PG stat statements is a matter of making sure you put it into your shared preload libraries, right? And I definitely recommend turning on track IO timing, okay? Tracking IO timing is a really important uh, and useful tool. I will caution you that enabling track IO timing does end up using up um, a bit of time, right? Because we have to ask the system clock before and after every IO to see what uh, time it took. Now, I strongly recommend that you go run a tool called PG test timing first. All right, PG test timing, uh, basically all that does is run and check and say, okay, how much time does it take to, to query the CPU to query that information about the timing? Uh, usually it's very fast. Um, in fact, there are some uh, comments in the PG uh, test timing output um, and in the man page that tell you uh, all right, this is how long this took um, and whether or not that's going to be a problem in your environment. It's, it's not typically an issue in most modern environments, even in modern uh, cloud or, or container environments, it's, it's not typically a problem. Um, so I, I definitely recommend enabling it. 
Uh, from Postgres's perspective, as long as the CPU time comes back quick, it doesn't add really that much overall time to your queries. Uh, once you do that, you have to run this create extension PG stat statements. Okay. When you run create extension PG stat statements, what you're going to get is a view called PG stat statements. You'll also get some other functions and whatnot. You don't really need to stress about those too much, but you're going to get this view back and you're going to be able to query that view to see all the queries that have been running in your system and how long they took. Right. Um, and let's talk about exactly what that includes. So here's this view, right? PG stat statements, uh, by default, it installs in the public schema. Um, I do recommend that um, you consider installing it into its own schema. Um, it really depends on your environment. One of the things I'll point out here is that when you install PG stat statements, it is uh, going to give you information um, across all databases. So you could just, uh, if you install your application into, you know, application database, uh, you could install PG stat statements into the Postgres database and then use it from there uh, and be able to see all the query IDs for all of the different uh, databases. So here you get the user, the database, query ID. Uh, this query ID is a hash of the query plan with all of the constants removed. Okay. And this is what allows PG stat statements to aggregate statements up and give you a top level report for that statement. As long as that statement looks uh, basically the same from the, from the query tree or the parse tree, um, it's gonna be the same uh, query according to PG stat statements. Um, now we don't guarantee that, that query ID is constant between major versions. Although uh, as far as I know, we haven't really made any significant changes lately. Um, and I would also say that it's going to typically be consistent through all minor versions of a particular major version. Uh, you then have the query text. Now, the amount of query text that you get um, is controlled in the same way the query text is for PG stat activity is controlled. So if you want to raise that, uh, you have to raise that, that parameter for track query size. Um, it's the same one for PG stat activity. But then you can see larger queries. By default, I think it's 1K, which is a pretty reasonable size for a query. Um, then you see how many times this query was called. You get the total time, right? And then you can get, obviously, um, an average time or a mean time. That's down here. We have min and max time, standard deviation, and the number of rows that were either returned or impacted by this particular query, right? So um, typically, you're going to be looking at select queries. Uh, and therefore, it's going to be the number of rows that end up getting returned back. Um, and that ends up being, being obviously really, really useful, and you can get an average of that and whatnot, too. So these are kind of your, your big numbers here first, right? So what I usually like to look at is, you know, what's the total time, right? What queries are taking up the most total time in my database system? And those are the ones that I tend to go look at first to see what I can do about them and how I can improve them. And I did want to point this out, right? PG stat statements and logging of queries, um, I like to think of them as complementary. Uh, one does not replace the other, right? Um, and in particular, if you have a high rate system where you aren't able to log every single query, you can at least get PG stat statements information for all of your queries. Uh, and that works out very well. Other information that you get, uh, you get all the different information about blocks that are hit, read, dirtied, written, et cetera, right? So um, this can be really helpful for figuring out, okay, did my query end up having to uh, go out to, to get data in, right? You can look at the block read time, block write time. Was my table able, sorry, was my query able to get everything from shared buffers, right? If everything was a hit, right, that's great. Um, unfortunately, why, if you start looking at how many reads you had to do, uh, then you can say, well, this query ended up having to read in, you know, a thousand or 10,000 blocks, right? And then I can go look at my block read time and block write time and say, oh, that's, you know, that's where all of my time in this query is going, is in actually having to read data back from the OS, potentially all the way back out to disk, right? That's really, really valuable information. This block read time and block write time is only going to be populated if you have that track IO timing uh, parameter enabled in Postgres. Um, so there's a query here, a question about uh, WorkMem and about 
uh, creating a temp file uh, in PG Badger logs and increasing work mem not helping. Uh, so there can be cases where that happens. Sometimes Postgres ends up um, wanting to materialize something, but ultimately what I think you'd have to do is uh, go look at the actual query plan. Uh, it should be pretty clear from the query plan when Postgres is going out to do a uh, external disk sort or if it's having to otherwise do something on disk with temp files. So I would recommend going and, and looking at uh, what the actual query plan is under a explain analyze to figure out uh, why it's ending up creating that, that temp area. Um, if you raise work mem like that, it, it, hopefully it's not coming from a, uh, from a sort, but it, it may still be. Um, it could also be from uh, a hash join, right? We sometimes uh, do what's called batching uh, with hash joins, and so uh, it could be because of that as well. So I would, I would go look at those and look at your actual query plan to see what's happening. So looking back at uh, looking at PG step statements, here's an example of output from PG step statements. And in this particular case, you can see there's a query ID here. Again, that's a that's a hash of the the query tree or the parse tree. Um, and then you can see the actual query here, the number of times it was called, and this is the overall time, right? And then you can see the mean time, min, max, standard deviation, etc. Number of rows impacted. So this is what it looks like when you want to go look at uh, a particular entry in PD stat statements. Um, so I would say, you know, in general, this query is quite fast, right? Sub millisecond, um, which is very, very good. The standard deviation isn't very high either. Uh, there was some time when there was a, obviously a high max time here, right? And so there's a question there of like, well, what was going on there? We have to go back and look at the actual log files to get some idea of what was going on. But I can imagine it was potentially because uh, maybe a checkpoint was happening, or uh, if I went back and looked, maybe that ended up having to do some direct I/O. Um, it's possible that maybe that the uh, this particular query that ended up with the max time just got um, stuck behind a lock, possibly for for a little bit of time. Uh, there's a lot of different possibilities. This is where you want to go back into your query logs, potentially if you have them. Uh, and be able to look and say, okay, where was that one that had a duration of 142 milliseconds? And then I can see what else was going on on the system at that time. Uh, here's another example. This is just a simple select, right? Obviously, this is ridiculously fast, right? Total time of only 516 milliseconds, and you can see the average time was very, very fast. Of course, this is also a very simple query, right? So, I mean, with those, you can actually um, be able to, to go back and say, okay, this query is probably not one I'm going to end up having to deal with too much, uh, you know, thankfully, right? So I'm going to give this a go real quick. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to stop sharing this deck and I'm going to go over and give you a quick look at, at um, PG Badger before we come back to uh, starting to look at understanding why queries are slow. All right, and I want to do this one. There we go. All right, hopefully that came through. It looks good on my preview. So here's an example of PG Badger, right? And here you can see after our PG Badger has been run, you can see this information about queries per second. You get these nice five minute averages. Uh, you can also see select queries here versus insert, update, and delete traffic. Uh, you can see query durations. All right, lots of really useful information. You can come down here and see this kind of general activity. You can go and look at across, you know, the hours in the day, read queries and write queries, prepared queries, et cetera. So lots of really useful information and details in here. This is kind of an overview. Uh, if you want, one of the ones that I like to go to is under queries. You can look at queries by type, right? This is obviously really helpful because you can see the different types of queries. You can also see queries by database, right? So here you can see, you know, all these queries were against this nightly database versus ones against other databases. Queries per user, duration per user. I mean, all of this fantastic information is available thanks to um, PG uh, Badger. And here, for example, is that queries per application, like I was mentioning. Now, if you want to look at top queries, like let's look at the time, you know, the top time-consuming queries. 
Right here, I see a min duration, max duration. Look at that, 23 seconds. That's an awful long query, right? And now I can actually, I know I have all of the details in here. And in fact, you can even ask PT Badger to give you examples, right? And it gives you examples with the exact time and date, and it gives you duration, database, all of this really useful information, right? If you're locking, if you have uh, locks uh, enabled, right? Logging lock weights, you can see, uh, for example, queries that are the most frequent waiting queries, right? Like this one here, which is a copy command. So this copy command is obviously loading data in, right? And that is um, ending up waiting on a lot of locks, right? Here's queries that waited them, you know, here's some more copy commands that waited, et cetera. Then you can look at uh, vacuum. So if you're worried about vacuum, maybe having a correlation with when your queries are getting slow, you can go look at that. Same thing over here with checkpoints, right? If you go look at checkpoint activity, you can see number of uh, buffers written, write time, sync time, et cetera. And here you can see, you know, checkpoint wall file usage across, uh, across different days and different times. So really, really useful information in here. Um, there's some event information as well. Uh, hopefully, I think that's gonna be getting updated because we actually in, in 13 added a lot of new wait events as well. Really, really useful stuff. So that's some quick examples of, of PG Badger. And when you run PG Badger, uh, you just run it against your log file as I showed, and it just will uh, spit out this uh, HTML report with all of this great useful information in it. And you can put that up on a web page. You can just load that up directly into your browser if you want um, and look at it. Uh, you can share it with other people easily that way too. PG Badger also has the ability to do incremental reports, which is really helpful. All right, let's get back to understanding why queries are slow. So we're going to go and move this over here, move that over there, and then share this. Give me one second. I just need to share back to my presentation. All right, hopefully that comes through. Looks like it is here. All right, so let's go talk about uh, different reasons, right? So you've got configuration issues, dead tuples and bloat, and query plans, right? So we're going to talk about a whole bunch of different Postgres uh, configuration options here. Uh, for different reasons why your queries might be slow. So I'm not going to talk about them right here. I'm going to go through all of them. So WorkMem. Uh, one of the things to be aware of is that WorkMem can end up getting allocated over and over again. Um, and it's also used for the bitmap max size. So uh, when you're doing a bitmap heap scan, one of the things you have to realize is that uh, when we build up that bitmap, we may get to a point where we run out of WorkMem amount of memory. In the event that that happens, we are going to uh, make that bitmap be a lossy bitmap. When the bitmap is lossy, it means that we end up having to do, um, uh, uh, having to visit potentially pages and tuples that we otherwise wouldn't have to visit, right? Because when it becomes lossy, we're losing some of the information about what's going on, and that can end up resulting in the bitmap not being um, exact. And if it's not exact, you're gonna end up hitting more pages than you maybe needed to. Uh, so definitely be considering uh, increasing work memory, especially if you're seeing sorts or you're seeing hash join batching. Okay, we'll talk some of that when we get to query plans. Maintenance work mem. Um, this is allocated by default uh, for the same size as auto vacuum worker processes um, and for create index processes. So if your create index is slow, you might want to increase maintenance work mem. That can help with that. Um, but I will also point out that uh, you can set the auto vacuum work mem independently from this if you need to. Effective cache size, it's never actually allocated. People sometimes have that misconception, right? It's just an estimate of the disk size, um, or, or of the disk cache, I should say. Uh, and so the amount of memory you have in Linux's file system cache is about what you want to imagine setting effective cache size to. Uh, a larger value here is going to increase uh, index usage, right? Because Postgres is, to be, is going to be thinking that it's cheaper to do random I.O. because it's expecting that disk um, that page that it wants from the disk to be in memory. Shared buffers. Um, so this is basically just a big cache of our files, uh, of all the files, right? Um, or as many of the files as we can fit. And it caches those disk pages more or less exactly as they are. Uh, you know, typical estimates for what you want to set shared buffers to are maybe 25 to 50% of system memory, uh, depending on the system, of course. Uh, PG Buffer Cache is another extension that's really, really useful for analyzing the contents of your shared buffers to be able to say, okay, um, this whole index is in memory. Why is this whole index in memory? What query 
am I running to pull the entire index into memory all the time? And I've seen that as something that's happened before. And I definitely recommend looking at uh, what relations are in your buffer because you want to have some idea and you want to make sure that you aren't caching things into your buffers that you don't need or don't want to. All right, um, when it comes to checkpoints, configuring of min and max wall size um, can be helpful. If you see any cases where you see checkpoints happening due to X log, that means that we had to, can, we had to start running a checkpoint immediately. That's gonna be a potential impact on your query. So definitely consider increasing max wall size if you see that. If you see checkpoint warnings, you really need to increase max wall size because you're kind of to the point where we're checkpointing like every 30 seconds and it gets a bit ridiculous. Uh, checkpoint segments is an old option that was replaced basically by these two parameters. Uh, checkpoint timeout, this is something you may want to increase. Um, now, if you're, uh, you should only be doing that if you're okay with uh, crash recovery taking longer, right? Because checkpoint timeout controls uh, how frequently we are checkpointing. By default, it's five minutes. I see people increase that to you know, half an hour, um, an hour maybe, although that's a really long time to go between checkpoints in my opinion. Um, I do recommend increasing checkpoint completion target up to maybe about 0.9. Uh, that's basically how much of the time between checkpoint timeouts that we'll actually use for doing a checkpoint. You typically wanna spread that out as much as possible. All right, dead tuples and bloat. Vacuum uh, is really important for going and dealing with bloat. Um, and making sure that there are reusable tuples um, or tuples that can be reused for new inserts and updates. So you really want those vacuums to be happening. Uh, you do need to watch out for bloat though, right? If you have tables that have lots and lots of bloat and you're doing a sequential scan through that table, we're still gonna have to go read all of those pages. So you may wanna be monitoring that. Um, of course, Check Postgres or, or PG Monitor are both good tools for looking at uh, bloat uh, and Eliminating all bloat ends up requiring a rewrite, which you typically don't want to end up doing. Um, but you can do that using either a cluster or a vacuum full. All right, so how do we get data out of Postgres? Right, you sequentially skip, sift through every record using a sequential scan. This is a bulk operation, can also be done with a bitmap. Um, you can also use an index of full specific records, uh, but you have to create those indexes, right? Uh, often those queries require accessing both the index and the heap, but the data gets to be uh, returned in order, which can be helpful to avoid sorts. Index only scans, these are really, really helpful. You like to see these, but you need to make sure you're running vacuum so that you have a, a, a current visibility map. Um, if you see something where you have all the co columns that you need in the index and Postgres is not doing an index only scan, it might be because there's no, uh, the visibility map is out of date sufficiently. Uh, once the visibility map gets very much out of date, we're gonna stop trying to do an index only scan because we aren't gonna think it's helpful. Instead, you wanna be considering using or considering doing a vacuum in such a case. When it comes to putting things together, there's a couple of options here. You can either do a nested loop, a merge join, or a hash join, right? Uh, nested loops are great for small sets, but they're not good for bulk, right? Merge joins are good for bulk, but require sorting the entire table. And that can be expensive. Maybe you can build an index to make that faster though. Uh, and uh, be able to avoid the sort, in which case, if you have a couple of indexes that Postgres can walk in a merge join, that can be very, very fast and very efficient. Um, a hash join is where we are gonna scan a table and build a hash table and then step through the other table. It's very, very fast uh, once it gets going, but it's got kind of a slow start because we have to build that hash table. It's also very memory intensive. Um, if you're seeing batching happening due to a hash join, you again, really wanna be considering increasing work mem because you'd be able to avoid batching. Batching in hash joins is, is a pretty expensive operation. Uh, adding things up, right? You can have a group ag or a hash ag, right? Group ag is just like a merge join kind of thing where you sort everything and then aggregate them together. Uh, hash ag, again, requires building a hash table. So it's very memory intensive, but uh, tends to be much, much faster. So you'd like to get to a point where you have a hash ag. If you see group ag happening, and you, you really think you want to have a hash tag, it's a good chance you need to increase work mem to address that. Obviously, it really depends, right, in terms of what's the best plan, right? The database gathers and uses statistics uh, with analyze or vacuum analyze, um, but bad stats are going to end up with bad plans. So one of the things you can do to check that out is always be looking at your explain analyzer results and check the results versus the estimate. Check the actuals versus the estimates. If there are many orders of magnitude off, you may wanna deal with that by increasing the statistics target uh, potentially on your tables or on your columns. 
or possibly using the new create statistics option that exists in Postgres to be able to uh, create extended statistics. That can be very helpful with like correlated columns in Postgres. Uh, you can also automate collection of plans using a tool called auto explain. Uh, this is not really a, an extension. It's, it's actually just a shared library that you can load, but you can load it up and then have uh, explained plans automatically logged. Obviously, this is going to be adding some uh, time to your queries. Uh, you can also have to do explain analyze, but that ends up being very expensive because it ends up rerunning the actual queries. Uh, there's a lot of different things you can get out of it. You can have different explained output options. Um, tools for analyzing your explained results are PTM in three and four or going to explain at depends.com. Really, really like this website. Definitely check it out. Check out the history page. Uh, there's a question about PG buffer cats producing too many temp files. Why is that? Chances are good. That's because um, it could be because you don't have WorkMem set up high enough if you're running PG uh, buffer cache underneath some kind of query. But you can also use PG buffer cache to query out specific query uh, specific things. But ultimately, you have to realize that you're pulling out all of the pages from shared buffers. If you have very large shared buffers, the result set from PG buffer cache is going to be quite large. All right, fixing flow queries. So you can, uh, with indexes, if you have like a sequential scan going on or and only a few rows returned, you definitely want to create an index, right? Look, be looking for opportunities to eliminate sequential scans. Um, as I mentioned before with WorkMem, if you've got sorting happening or a merge join, you want to be looking at increasing WorkMem. Um, if you have like a large data set and you're seeing a nested loop, make sure that your statistics are correct, right? Make sure you're doing an analyze. You may want to increase your stats target. Uh, this is another interesting one that's really important. If you have indexes with foreign keys and you are doing deletes, like ca cascading deletes, for example, uh, and that delete is slow, it might be because there's no um, index on the referring column, okay? Uh, the referring column in a foreign key relationship in Postgres does not require an index. And if you're doing cascading deletes, if there's no index there, then Postgres is having to do a sequential scan through the entire thing, and that's not going to be very efficient. So create an index on that referring table on that column so that Postgres can use that to improve the performance of that delete. Uh, prepared queries are great. Uh, plan once, run many is, is uh, a way, you know, something you want to be considering. Um, the plan cache does have uh, generic and specific plans, so that's something to be aware of. Um, and there's kind of this five-time rule where if the same query is run with a generic plan, you know, from the prepared, same prepared queries run, and we pick the generic plan five times in a row, we're going to keep using that generic plan, right? And if we end up doing that, you could find that later on queries end up not being as performant, which is no good. So something to consider. Um, just a quick kind of comments on query review, right? Uh, select count star, an index can actually help this case uh, because select count star can do an index only scan, which is great. But we still have to go check all of the records. So it's not as efficient as you might like, right? Try to avoid select count stars if you can, right? If you're selecting star from a table, that's going to return all columns and rows, right? Is every row needed? Is every column needed? One of the things to be aware of is that Postgres has a toasting mechanism where we actually will take a large value and put it off into a side table called a toast table, right? If you're doing a select star, we got to detoast that, which might also involve decompressing it and stream it back to you. That can be very expensive, so try to avoid that. Watch out for select distinct. Usually ends up you're, like you're missing a join condition possibly. In general, I don't like this kind of um, uh, comma split joins. All right, I definitely recommend using a join syntax like the one down here. Um, a couple of other comments. If you're seeing a lot of where, you know, some value in a, a big select here, uh, it's usually possible to join that into a join, which allows for uh, more options for Postgres to execute that. Um, and usually we're going to find better solutions. Even better, though, is, is looking for a not in, right? Or, or sorry, not exists opportunity. If you can do a not exists instead of a not in, that's going to end up potentially being turned into a left join or what's called an anti join, which may be much more efficient. Um, CTEs are, are an interesting challenge. Uh, depending on the version of Postgres, they may or may not be materialized for you, right? So typically you want to consider with CTEs. Uh, trying to eliminate as many rows as possible as early on as possible with your CTEs. So that very first CTE, try to do all your expensive work there and then build on top of that in the simpler query, in the lower level queries, right? Um, Postgres 12 and above has improved that situation though. We'll actually attempt to pull CTEs into the overall query if possible. 
Um, you can also use a really, really fast count star for an entire table by looking at rel tuples if you want. It's based on stats though, so you can't really trust it. All right, last, couple, last slide before we get into an opportunity maybe to have questions, although I think we're just about out of time. Um, when it comes to tuning Postgres, increase your work mem, increase maintenance work mem, and set effective cache size, right? Possibly increase shared buffers. Definitely consider partial and functional, functional indexes. If you can create a partial index that has way fewer uh, amounts of entries in it, that can be way faster, but make sure that it's actually getting used, right? Um, also for a functional index, if you build an index on the results of a function, double check that the query plan is actually gonna use that index, right? Um, if it's not using that index, it's not helping you any, right? Um, and to that point, you can look at pgstat user indexes to see what indexes are actually being used. More indexes means slower write. So uh, all those unused indexes, they have to be maintained. So be aware of that um, and possibly consider getting rid of them, right? Um, now don't get rid of any indexes that are backing constraints though. So you'll have to go check that and make sure that the index isn't part of a constraint or you might end up uh, losing that constraint. Uh, and you don't want that, that would be, that would be worse than, you know, that, that's a fix um, that, uh, that isn't worth it. All right, and that's what I have here. Um, I answered a couple of questions. I, I know I'm out of time here. I'm not sure if Dan will give me another minute or two, um, but if you do have a question, um, I, I'm happy to, to ask a, a quick question or two. Answer a quick question or two. I can also try and skip over to IRC if I have that somewhere. Um, see a lot of, okay, PG, is PG repack a good alternative to vacuum full to address bloating? Uh, I, I know a lot of people who use PG repack. I'm not a huge fan of it myself, I have to admit. Um, just because I, I feel like, you know, Postgres should have something to do that ourselves. Um, and I, I worry about tools like that that operate um, as an extension and aren't built into core because they're obviously touching a lot of really important bits um, to make it all work. So I'm a little bit, you know, I, I'm not saying don't use it, but I'm also saying um, definitely, you know, kind of validate things afterwards and make sure it all looks good. Uh, the problem with the vacuum full is that we rebuild the entire table in a, uh, in a manner that requires an exclusive lock and having to take an exclusive lock makes the table offline for the duration, right? When it comes to uh, addressing bloating, you know, my recommendation is fix your auto vacuum, right? If you're having bloating issues, it's likely because you're not auto vacuuming fast enough um, and you ought to be looking at making auto vacuum more aggressive. Um, also, Postgres will end up uh, releasing data back or releasing space back to the OS if all of the pages at the end of a table are empty. Are there any tools to dynamically determine uh, wall checkpoint config values? Uh, I'm not aware of any tools to dynamically determine that. What I will say is that I would recommend um, contemplating how much uh, data you're going to end up writing in a given period um, and then consider how much data you could possibly write like benchmark your io subsystem see how much you can actually push um, and based on that you may want to uh, use that to size your your max uh, your max wall size right maybe somewhere in between those two numbers is what you want to be thinking about but make absolutely sure you have enough space on your wall volume because if you don't have enough space on your wall volume uh, you could eventually run out of disk space and then panic and then all the queries stop and they go very slow after that. Um, all right, I don't see any other questions that I didn't already answer. Um, there's a way, okay, do foreign keys require an index? Uh, the referred to side does require a index, but not on the referring side, right? So that's a problem. All right, last question. Any reason why the duration is on a separate line? By default in the log. Uh, again, go back to log min duration statement, enable log min duration statement instead of uh, using log duration, and you'll get the, uh, the duration on the same line. So that's why I recommend using log min duration statement and don't use log duration or um, log statement. All right, I think that's it. I'm five minutes over, and I wanna make sure Dan has time to go do whatever else he needs to do and uh, that you guys can all get on to your next session. So I'll be around on IRC for a little while longer. Feel free to... Uh, to ping them. Uh, I'm Snowman on IRC if you're not sure, uh, but this has been great. I've really enjoyed chatting with everyone, and uh, I hope you all enjoy the rest of uh, PGCon Virtual 2020. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>